we're now going to get into our uh, main segment. Uh, mostly some education, but also giving our personal talks, since this is a new show. Giving uh, some personal talks and our own takes on the different political factions in Canada. How we feel about them. How we differ. How we're the same. Um, and what they stand for. So. I'm going to start off with a good, uh, really cool article from the Canada Guide here. Here. Our little face is at the bottom there. So uh, we already covered how Canadian political parties work. So we're going to start by explaining the Canadian party system today. So Canada has what is called a uh, called the two party plus system. This means the country is usually dominated by two large parties, one of the left broadly favoring social reform and activist government. Sorry, I, I couldn't get through that with a straight face. And one of the right broadly favoring social tradition and limited government and also genocide and fascism. Sorry, I just I read I read between the lines. There is almost always a strong third party place as well, either the further left or further right that threatens to bump off one of the big two. Which curiously never does. Curiously, instead of instead of threatening to bump off one of the big two, seems to align itself with one of the big two. Jug meat, looking at you. So first, we have the Liberal Party Canada. This is the current uh, party in power. Liberal Party Canada is the party that currently rules Canada under Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, the man with the man who broke the world record for most times in blackface, while somehow calling other people racist every time. It is the country's oldest political party and the most historically successful. When liberals are feeling particularly <laughs> boastful. Oh, damn. I didn't know this, this, this side had smoke. They like to call themselves Canada's natural governing, governing party in recognition of the fact that they've held power for such long periods of Canadian history. And yet, or, yeah. Born as a movement of reform-minded middle-class French Canadians and Catholics in the mid-19th century, by the early 20th century, the Liberals had evolved into a more generic centrist party favoring traditional British liberal values of free markets and personal responsibility, as well as tolerant relations between French and English Canadians. <clears throat> so Sir Wilfrid Laurier, 1841 to 1919, who championed all of the above to become the most successful and long-reigning of Canada's early liberal prime ministers, remains an iconic figure of common sense, moderate Canadian liberalism of this period. After World War II, 1939 to 1945, liberals moved in a more notably left-wing direction, particularly during the long reign of liberal prime minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau, Suspicious of the free market and worried about social division. Uh, whenever you see free market, just read capitalism. Mm -hmm. Because idiots think they're interchangeable. Uh, Trudeau believed a lover, a, a lover, a larger, more <laughs> activist Canadian government could help alleviate the country's social and economic ills and create what he dubbed a just society of compassion and equality. A worsening financial situation in the 1990s caused the next two liberal prime ministers, John Chrétien and Paul Martin, to move more to the right on fiscal matters, which, spoiler alert, does not actually fix a worsening financial situation. Adopting generally conservative ideas about the pro importance of keeping taxes low and budgets balanced. Liberal Party today, this is just like weird, the way this reads. Now led by Pierre Trudeau's son, Justin Trudeau. <laughs> Is that just normal, I guess? Nope, not at all. Like, 
Oh, the son is in in charge. Yeah, no dynasties at all. Um, yeah, but in in the DBRK, it's the end of the world because the same guy led twice. I've said it a million times before. The West's rules only apply to the West. They don't apply to any other country. At that point, well, it's like bad. It's good for me. What's good for me is bad for you kind of idea. It's, wait, that's not the... That is not what I meant to say, but you get the idea. Yeah. They've had, they've had hit piece articles on China where they just point out an identical policy that China's done to like a Western policy, but then they just put up what cost at the end and they called it day. They're like, yeah, no, it's it's bad when they do it because it's not like, yeah, it's high speed rail. But at what cost? Well, actually, at uh, at no cost. Last I checked, but uh, okay. <clears throat> so, um, the modern liberal party portrays itself as a party that is fiscally responsible but socially progressive. So. I'm going to translate that a little bit. Fiscally, what is fiscally responsible but socially progressive mean? Well, it is your standard uh, liberal take. Basically, uh, economically, they are on the right, but socially, they're on the left. So lean into the culture stuff, right? To make them, to give them that veneer of virtue. But when it comes to actual, you know, help and support for working class people, well, they're just a little too right. They can't do anything. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like it's kind of like they'll give someone else's home to someone to stay in, but they'd never let someone stay in their own home. Yeah, pretty much. And just to kind of I can summarize it with ODSB. ODSB currently gives someone about a thousand and change, maybe a bit more now, a thousand dollars a month to live on. Mm -hmm. They give you like 600 of it, I believe, for rent and the other 400 for everything else. So they're doing something. They're not giving you nothing. They're not saying if you're disabled, you are going to just die. But it's so bad that people and we're going to get into this on another episode. I'm just going to make a note of that because I came up with it. I think That's we should cover cool. made. I think yeah. we should cover made like big time. Yeah, actually, that uh, that has some reminiscence of some times in uh, Nazi Germany. They use some very similar yeah. uh, sales techniques. But just to bring up made for a second, the reason I'm pointing that out is because I saw this story of someone who they couldn't survive because of disability. So they felt their only option was to die. So yes, they will give you disability, but it will never be enough. And that is kind of the TLDR of the liberal party of today. They will do the absolute bare minimum, which at the end of the day is not enough anyway. So it doesn't really matter. And the thing is the clusterfuck with ODSP specifically, specifically is that it doesn't give you enough to live on but then if you try and get income any other way, it claws back the ODSB. So yeah. at That's the end like of the day, in Alberta. Yeah. So at the end of the day, like you really don't have any options. You either sit on that thousand yeah. and make like a tiny bit more, and then it's clawed back anyway, so it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Or I don't know, you force yourself while disabled to somehow go back into the workforce. Another product of neoliberal capitalism, because these mm -hmm. these systems, these social systems are designed to force you back into producing for the capitalist class. Yep. Now let's get to the Conservative Party of Canada. <clears throat> the Conservative Party of Canada, the CPC, is Canada's second largest fascist part. Sorry, second largest <laughs> party in parliament. That slips. I don't know why. And the party that currently forms the official opposition to Justin Trudeau's ruling liberals, it is also technically Canada's newest party, having been founded in 2003 by merging the Progressive Conservative Party with the Canada Canadian Reform Conservative Alliance Party. 
This represented a, this represented an effort to rebuild a single unified conservative party of the sort that had existed for most of Canadian history. A reminder, a reminder that if you think these parties are different, Pierre Polyev has voted in lockstep with Justin Trudeau over six hundred times. Jeez, look it up. That's go look it up. These are the two opposing <laughs> parties. Just saying. <clears throat> All yeah, those if you tell people there, that, if you tell that to like older people, they're like, oh, that's just democracy working. Yeah. It's like, it's, you get this party or you get this party, largely nothing's going to change, but there might be a, a couple small details that you'll, you'll, you'll throw up your hands over. Do you want a red cover or a blue cover to the book this year? Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. It's basically like changing the book color cover. We got some history uh, here on the Conservative Party. Reform Party. The Conservative Party today, if forced to define themselves, today's Conservatives would describe their party as one that favors low taxes, low regulation of business, smaller, less bossy government, a strong regime of law and order, a strong, mili <laughs> a strong military. <laughs> Do they actually say that? Oh, no. We have the strongest military at West End. And respect for traditional values, particularly in contrast to so-called woke priorities that are seen to be overly preoccupied with race, gender, and sexuality-based activism. It's not a bug. That's what I keep arguing. It's a feature. Mm -hmm. The reason why these parties, much like America, focus so much on culture issues is because they don't got shit for you economically. There's nothing on the table there. Nothing yeah, on the table that actually threatens the pocketbooks of the rich and powerful. Yep, it's just simply stuff to distract us from more important things that we sh should be focusing on. <clears throat> like everybody being poor, for example, but apparently that's not a big issue. That's just because they didn't pull up their work boots. Yeah. In 2017, following the electoral defeat of Prime Minister Harper, which is a depressing moment for myself because I held my nose and voted for Trudeau because my ass got taken for a ride and I thought he was actually going to bring about electoral reform. Spoiler alert. I, I, I didn't. I didn't think he was going to be nearly what he's turned out to be. It's I thought scary. he'd just be boring. I thought he'd just be boring. <laughs> but I mean, I'm going to love I that now. Yeah. Back then, I hadn't rabbit holed into like, World Economic Forum. Tune in next episode. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, the other I, I didn't rabbit hole into how deep the corruption goes with our governments. Uh, but the Conservatives, after that defeat, elected former Speaker of the House of Commons Andrew Shulman. Oh, man, that guy was such a shit show. As their new leader. After failing to unseat the Liberals in the 2019 federal election, Sheer resigned in 2020 replaced by former cabinet minister Aaron O'Toole, who in turn failed to unseat the Liberals in the 2021 election and was removed by the party in early 2022. Scheer and especially O'Toole were considered fairly ideologically moderate and uh, partially in response to this in September of 2022, the party elected former cabinet minister an actual dad of Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes, Pierre Polyev, as their fourth ever leader, who's usually described as more populist. Yeah. Pierre, who is known for attracting large, large audiences to his rallies, where he rails against the power of gatekeepers. Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, Canada is leaning so hard into American politics. He's just trying to LARP as, as, as Maple Trump. I might call yep. him that from now on. Just call him Maple Trump. That works. And it, it is. They're, but all they're doing is trying to recreate what happened in the States about seven years ago. Yeah. 
So he rails against the power of gatekeepers in elite institutions like bureaucracy, mainstream media. Mm-hmm. Will accordingly mark a much sharper contrast in both style and substance when he runs against Prime Minister Trudeau. Next general election is currently scheduled for fall of 2025. So next year, we got all of the rest of this year, and we got a full other year, which I expect to be a absolute headache. Next, we got my man right there. God bless. Jackie. Glad he's not around to see <laughs> to see what happened to his party. I'm glad he's dead. What? <laughs> I mean, I'd be so mad. Oh my god, I would be mad. Okay. Oh, he's we'll probably losing it up there. Just, ah! I'm gonna come back down there. I just noticed he kind of looks a little bit like Lennon. Never noticed that. A little bit, yeah. You can see that. He's got Lennon, Lennon energy, Lenergy, if you will. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> so let's get into the NDP, just to kind of teal the art a little bit. Imagine for Americans watching. Imagine if the squad had a party, their own political party, like AOC, Bernie, all those, all those people. They kind of broke off into their own party. It's kind of in a nutshell what the NDP kind of resents up here, in my opinion. Founded during the midst of the Great Depression, as you would do, 1929 to 1939, Canada's new Democratic Party, first known as Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, that's just a base name. It was originally a doctrinaire socialist party. Oh no, not the evil word. <gasps> ah! Dedicated to the democratic overthrow of the capitalist. Oh man, what happened, guys? You had it. You knew what was going on. Shit, the bad. An implementation of government planned economy in its place. In the decades since, the NDP has moved in a more moderate direction and today champions the useless goal of a social democratic society with a mixed economy in which the government tightly regulates the economy but doesn't run it, except it doesn't tightly regulate the economy. Yeah, it's like it doesn't regulate just, anything. And furthermore, if you just keep capitalism going, whatever regulations you do, the capitalist system will have an answer for it. You don't believe me? Go look at layoffs every single time they increase the minimum wage. Million other examples. Just saying. Yeah. There's no compromise under capitalism. They're going to get the bag one way or another. Today, the NDP is considered quite similar to the Liberal Party. Oh, no. Oh. Canada guy just murdered. I'd like to report a murder. Yeah. They just did a murder here. I'm sorry. As a man of the far left, to the point where I'm probably on a watch list of some kind. This is a murder. It takes a more aggressively progressive position on taxing the wealthy and large corporations, environmental regulation, and non-interventionist foreign policy. Non-interventionist Good. foreign policy. Good. That is a great we can do plan. A- Leave every country to let themselves run by themselves. Yep. Such a novel concept. Canada has never had an NDP prime minister. And for most of its history, the, liter- the NDP has consistently come in a distant third or fourth place in the parliamentary seat count. Only once. In uh, 2011, did it come in second, briefly surpassing the Liberals? Better times. Much better times. Mm-hmm. And I will go on record and say... That was my proudest vote to this day. That's the only vote I've ever been proud of voting. Voted for Jack Layton. And I do it again. I'd vote for his body. For his skeleton. What kind of condition do you think Jack Layton's corpse is okay? <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> I'm ADHDing uh, in a way too dark direction. Probably pretty uh, 
gone at this point. We need to it's find an a, necromancer. J- it's more of a Jack Skeleton now. <laughs> Jack Skeleton. Important Canadian social programs such as old age pensions and natural, national Medicare are usually at least partially credited to NBT, NDP deal making in closely divided parliaments of the past. Following the 2011, de- you're going to make me relive this. Following the 2011 <laughs> death of the popular, popular Jack Layton, the NDP elected Quebec politician Thomas Mulcair as leader reflecting the growing power of the of that province in the party after a disappointing showing in the 2015 general election in 2016 the ndp voted to remove mulcair and in 2017 jagmeet singh was elected in his place former lawyer and the son of sikh immigrants from india Singh is the first non-white, non-Christian person to lead a Canadian political party. Oh my God, so brave! <laughs> he's, so he's known for his. He's he's, he's brain dead. He, like, like has Jagme done anything of note? He, he's the same thing as Bernie. He just writes strongly worded letters. He's just like, like I know a liberal government should do more, and then nothing happens. Like, I know India condemned him for supporting terrorists. I mean, I actually got to get caught up in his stances, but they're probably largely the same as our liberal government. A lot of lip service, no follow through, still supporting the bad guys. Yeah, uh, every time. But yeah. Yeah, I'm going to move slowly along uh, real quick. Uh, did you want to read that bit on the Bloc Québécois real quick? I have to pee really bad. Perfect. All right. Okay. Here as, we discussed, as we discussed more in detail in the Quebec chapter, one of the biggest issues in contemporary Canadian politics is whether or not the French-speaking province of Quebec should separate from Canada and form its own country. In Canadian political lingo, people who support this idea are known as separatists, and the Quebec Bloc Québécois is Canada's leading separatist political party. Founded in 1990 by Lucien Bouchard, born in 1938, former progressive conservative cabinet minister, the Bloc was Canada's first national political party to openly support Quebec separatism and remained the most popular political party in the province until recent, until quite recently. The Bloc only runs candidates in Quebec, and for this reason, it is impossible for it ever to form the government of Canada. But that's not the point. By voting Bloc, Quebecers are expressing their disdain for the Canadian system and essentially opting out of federal politics altogether. As Bloc MPs would put it, they're going on going to Ottawa to defend the interests of Quebec and nothing else. Ideologically, ideologically wow, I can't talk. The Bloc is quite left-wing, perhaps, unsurprisingly considering Quebec is said to be the most left-wing region in all of North America, though they won't ever be in a position to impose an agenda of their own. The Bloc MPs do sit in Parliament and vote just like <clears throat> everyone else. And controversially, wow, I cannot read it all. Controversially, collect their paycheck and pensions. To the party had very poor showing in the 2011 and 2015 elections, suffered from chronic leadership instability following the departure of longtime party leader Gilles Doucet, born 1947, in 2015. The party staged a big comeback in 2019 general election under leadership Yev. Francois Blanchet, born 1965. However, 
Blanchette is a former minister in the separatist administration that the government of Quebec from 2012 to 2014. Under his leadership, the bloc has recovered its former losses and once again sits as the parliament's third biggest party. <clears throat> Thanks, man. Appreciate that. No uh, how would you? There we go. How would you? Uh, how would you explain Quebec, just like to non-Canadians? Because I know a lot of people who aren't Canadian who are just confused. They're like, "What's happening? What is? It's what is like, going on?" It's a bit like Hawaii, I think, in the states, or even Puerto Rico. To a certain degree, a little bit, yeah. They're not, it's not really the same. It's basically like if you had a family member that's like, "I don't want to be here," and they keep trying to leave, and they never quite get out the door. <laughs> yeah, and it, and I don't, a- and I don't say it negatively. Like I understand why Quebec wants to leave. They are ran very differently. They actually, their cost of living in Quebec is considerably better than like in the rest of like Alberta, especially. Like I have friends, I have friends there that like, they, I think they're managing um, a Tim Hortons, which is not a normally lucrative career, but they own their own home. They go on vacation. They're they're not struggling by any <clears throat> means. Like they also can work listen. a relatively normal job and own a home. That's not a bad thing. Also, listen, Quebec has a world-renowned party city. To which, if you want to party, this is literally where you go, and it's not even close. In and Montreal. Yeah, Let's and they gave us poutine forget. and beaver tails. Yeah, yeah that'd be a, be a good episode to do too. The the, we, the weird cuisine up here, and we I mean, listen, guys. We take poutine oh, to eleven. That's true. You get some buffalo chicken poutine. Mm-hmm. Don't care poutine is great. Also, yeah, we went to give us Jean Chrétien, which is probably. The greatest prime minister in Canadian history ever. Guy breaks into the parliamentary house. I'll take care of this one. Mm-hmm. Like, he didn't need security. He was security. <laughs> yeah, really. <clears throat> yeah, so, like, basically, Quebec has their own kind of... Their own kind of party. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's... Uh, Quebec's interesting in general because it's it's the reason French is our second language, which yeah. I, I get is kind of confusing too, uh, yeah. especially because like it's essentially the only province that predominantly speaks French. That was kind of a accommodation we made. Now, for the record, I don't speak French. I tried and I failed. I do speak multiple languages, but I I couldn't pick up the French thing. In fact, my to be honest, I think it's better than my French. I'll say yeah. that. Well, well, one of, one of those languages might be a little more important than the other in the future. Yeah, I'm working on it now. <laughs> I think everybody should. And I, as I admitted before, I'm like, my dad told me to learn that language. No joke. Like 20 years ago. And I'm kicking myself. It's, it's kind of funny. It's funny how like sometimes the our old folks. We're like, ah, oh, you nut jobs. And now we think about it like, damn. They, they were on to something. He was literally like, he's like, you should learn Mandarin Chinese. China is going to dominate America. And I'm like, that's crazy. I said that yeah. 20 years ago, that's crazy. And I'm like. Well, and they've done it without firing weapons, too. They haven't taken over anywhere. They haven't destroyed yeah, other just countries like, and stolen. They just invested in their own country, and look what happens. Things work. But free education? Oh, no. Oh, wait. They're all incredibly well-educated. That even, like, people in the poorest areas of China 
are getting educations where they're getting accepted to like the best universities to like the best programs. Like yeah. these people are coming from like mud huts <clears throat> and then developing like life saving DNA technology, this kind of stuff. It it's quite amazing to see that kind of stuff. This is again, this is what happens when you don't have a whole entire society that is based on war, which mm-hmm. is what America and its allies, even up here in Canada, has basically yeah. been doing. Our bread and butter is imperialism, always has been. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as Dane Cook said, imperialism is the highest form of capitalism. <laughs> It's it wasn't the smartest cut, thing that guy that. ever said. <laughs> so God's going to give us credit this. for that one. I know French enough. I know enough French to confuse the shit out of telemarketers. <laughs> um. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to move on to. It gets a little confusing now because we also have a Green Party. So. If you might, if you're asking, oh, Green Party. So it's like base, like Jill Stein, like that kind of Green Party. No. Um, and if that lady looks familiar, she is in the intro arguing about farts. Uh, she doesn't like the word fart. She very it's much very does not like the word fart. <laughs> now, I've always found this party confusing. Uh, Given that the NDP exists, I always found that, I don't know about you, I always found it confusing that like this, because like, realistically, if you look at their platform and you look at the NDP's platform, um, they're not extremely different here. Realistically, it could just kind of join forces, but again, the Green Party is a relatively new player on the Canadian platform scene though it's been around for more than 30 years it did not begin winning a was... significant hmm? i was just say sorry i my adhd brain went in there i wonder if no, they were brought around to kind of take down votes from the ndp i kind of always figure that as well it's like break break like because you never see this on the right except for one uh We'll get into that at the end. The the weird the weird party I call them. Uh, I don't think anybody knows what to do with them really, <laughs> but we'll get into that. Um, you never see this kind of factioning on the right, even it, especially in the states. It's just the Republicans, and that's it. You got libertarians, but most of them just vote Republican. It's like, but when you get into the left, there's all these splits where it's like. NDP, the Greens. uh, It never made sense to me that these are two different factions. Yeah. They have been around for more than uh, 30 years, but they didn't start winning significant numbers of votes until the early 2000s. And they didn't really elect their first member of parliament until 2011. Initially, the Greens were simply a one-issue party exclusively devoted to raising awareness of the environment until former leaders Jim Harris and especially Elizabeth May, fart lady, uh, (laughs) sought to broaden the Greens' appeal and mark themselves as more center-left populists. So, we got a lot of center-left stuff here, guys. Today, green candidates tend to try to stand out by presenting themselves as respectable political outsiders who are less corrupt and cynical than politicians from other parties. It is common for greens to advocate for sweeping reforms to the Canadian political system, including changing the electoral system, which they say is currently biased against small parties like theirs. It also is undemocratic. And I'm gonna I'm gonna drive I need to drive this home a little bit. First past the post voting is not democratic. If you are voting for a party for the sole purpose of not letting the other big party win, that ain't democratic because you feel like you have to vote that way. Otherwise, you are taking votes away 
from the lesser evil. This lesser evil mm-hmm. voting shit is not democratic. It never has been. No. To my Americans watching, you you understand my frustration, I'm sure. Whether you're whether you're like someone who doesn't particularly like Trump but have to vote for him, or doesn't particularly like uh cackle cop over there, but you feel like you gotta vote for her. Her and her zero policies. Um you get it. It's the same up here. <clears throat> I digress. <clears throat> uh, let's see. The Greens' outsider status helps the party attract the support of many Canadians uh, who have outside the mainstream opinions on things like medicine, disease, and the role of larger corporations in Canadian society. I think what they mean by medicine and disease is, to my, I think this was the only party outside of the conservatives that actually had an okay stance on like stuff like uh, mandates. <clears throat> okay. I'll have to fact, ch- fact check me on that though. That just, I, I, I think I saw something. So I'm not stating that with certainty. That said, the environment still remains a major green preoccupation, particularly climate change. And the party is known for advocating the most dramatic opposition to things like fossil fuels and mining. The Canadian news media has treated the Greens as a major party since the 2000s, a period in which the Greens began consistently winning about 3 to 6 percent of the popular vote, but very few seats. In 2019, they elected three members of parliament, a new record, though. Excuse me. In 2021, that number shrunk to just two, probably because the NDP exists. Green parties have proven more successful at the provincial level, however, and throughout the 2010s. A handful of Greens were elected to legislatures of several provinces, fact which has helped establish the party as the constant third or fourth place party in many provinces, even as they languish in fifth place nationally. The Green Party has has led by, has led by, I hate it when they do this. It screws up my weird neurodivergent brain. Has been led by Elizabeth Maine May for more uh, for most of the last 15 years, first from 2006 to 2019, and now 2022. All right, now we're getting into weird territory. So this one doesn't even people. count as a party. <laughs> this whole thing, I still have no idea. I don't even know what to do with the People's Party. I don't. Yeah. It's like <clears throat> it's like if Alex Jones made a Canadian political party. I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> Did you want to read this one? <laughs> uh, you can if you like. Yeah, sure. Give you a break. In 2018, former Conservative Cabinet Minister and Member Member of Parliament. Maxime Bernier loudly quit the Conservative Party and announced he was forming a new party, the People's Party of Canada, the PPC. Bernier had long been one of the most outspoken and eccentric members of the Conservative Party, known for his libertarian opinions often to the right of his party's mainstream. He claimed his decision to quit the party was motivated by his opposition to what he considered excessive moderation under former leader Andrew Scheer. To date, his new People's Party has mostly defined itself as being more conservative than the Conservative Party, particularly on issues relating to immigration and multiculturalism. The PPC performed poorly in the 2019 general election, its first winning only 1% of the vote. In the 2021 election, it fared significantly better, winning 5% of the vote, but zero seats, a benchmark often thought of as representing the standard for what constitutes a major party in Canada. The party's improved showing has been widely attributed to the strong position Bernier took in the position to various public safety measures 
that were imposed during the COVID-19 pandemic, including masking, vaccine passport, mandatory vaccines, and sometimes even vaccines in general. It remains unclear if the PPC is involved in involving into a permanent player in the Canadian politics or its success in 2021 was simply the result of populist backlash to a very particular situation. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so this guy's a bit of a lunatic. He's... Oh, okay. Sorry, I was... Uh... I was looking for a tweet to kind of summarize where this guy's at. Oh, you weren't and, uh, even listening to my beautiful voice. How I was. dare you? <laughs> Part of the beauty of ADHD is you have multitasking ability that erodes the fabric. So this is where this guy's <laughs> at. Climate change hysteria is just a fabricated pretext to destroy our economy and impose communism. Everything we don't like is communism. A book to capitalism. I don't even know what to do with that sentence. We're, but again, if you're in America, this might sound familiar, right? The liberals are doing a communism. They're not doing a useless center-left compromise with capitalism. They're doing a communism. The PPC is the only party that commits to withdraw from the Paris Accord. So, so he doesn't this, believe... Uh, hmm? Do you know the story about the Greenpeace guy that he's showing a video of? I don't. What is the story about this guy? So he was one of the original co-founders of Greenpeace, but he actually left them because... He said they Oxide started is a going pollutant like and somehow dangerous. against science and like we're clearly getting infiltrated. So he was like, I'm out. He basically just left. But he was one of the founding members, if I believe, if I remember correctly. Interesting. Yeah. Because he's like, there is some, like, there is some like factual stuff to like climate change and that kind of stuff. Like, Probably not burning so much fossil fuels is probably not the worst idea. But he said he's like, it kind of got away from actual truth telling. And it was mostly, I think, just kind of um, like hysteria and just over the top kind of crap that wasn't helping. Well, my, my position is pretty correct. solid. I, uh, I don't think we can predict the future. I definitely think that we are destroying the environment. But I will say this, regardless of your personal opinions on climate change, you should at this point understand that our government, any Western government, will never have the capacity or the ability to correctly deal with climate change. Because people, someone in the chat, who can tell me what is the largest producer? Of emissions, the largest polluter in the world. What? What complex, if you will? You can tell me. If you were to name some type of complex. Yeah, oh. I, I fuck. I, I completely shit the bed there because I gave the whole game away. The military industrial said, complex, people. Huh. And you'll never hear any of these people talk about that. No, that's why a lot like of people are jumping for shit. plastic straws. Yeah, that no. like that's the thing. If the world was like a good peaceful place, and they're like, okay, we found out plastic straws are ending up in turtles, we're gonna have to like change over to like some paper straws till we figure out something else. People would be like, you know what, that seems reasonable. But when you can see like bo nuclear bombs being dropped, and it's like plastic straws, that's the problem. No. That's the pro that's that's the biggest problem we have. The biggest problem 
is that they're trying to put the burden on the proletariat, on the working class, where it's completely misplaced. Our carbon footprints are not, they're not even in the same galaxy. As carbon footprints, corporations, a big business, a big military that, uh, according to Snork Y2K, big church, I didn't know about that. I'd love to look into that more. Um, let me put that up. Uh, we're not even comparable. Nothing we do will ever matter, even in mass. We can come close to the footprint that these people are doing, and nobody's talking about that. They're just talking about like, yeah, you need to go eat crickets and live in a 10-minute city, or 50-minute city, rather, because we got to save the environment, and they're not looking at the elephant in the room, which is yeah. like, well, we've got a massive industrial machine the world over that is creating just wreaking havoc on the environment but nobody has the as the as the as the twig and berries nobody has cash and prizes to stand up to that so of course we gotta blame and they're not teaching anyone like ways to mitigate their carbon footprint all they're saying is we gotta raise taxes and make 15 minute cities they don't talk about self-sustainability. They don't, they're not sending people out seeds and teaching people how to grow stuff. No, none of that. They're just simply being like, we got to raise taxes. Like, that's not a solution. Also, again, I'd be fine with that if the taxes went to anything, but I'm not seeing it. Exactly. I'm not yeah. seeing it. I'm not seeing it anywhere. I'm not seeing the material conditions of ordinary, normal working class people improve. They've just gotten worse. Everybody I know is in debt. People are at the point where they don't know what to do with all the debt. Some people are so buried in debt that they literally don't think they can ever climb out of it outside of the winning lottery. And a little bit of an anecdote. I, I've done bankruptcy. I was in bad debt. Mm hmm. Um, my wife did as well. But again, also on top of that, the most depressing thing, it's a little thing, but I got a convenience store over here that I walked to to buy, uh, well, to mostly buy, buy uh, snacks or, or soda pop when I'm like, when I need to stress. You're buying eat, those smut stress. magazines, aren't you? Actually, the biggest thing I buy is um, I'm a bit of a jerky addict. I wish it didn't cost uh, like a million jerky. dollars, but I'm a huge like I'm su I'm such a whore for jerky. Uh, jerky is delicious. <laughs> but I see every single day. I see multiple people every single day going in there and buying a lottery ticket. And lottery, the lottery, uh, that would be a great ep episode as well, covering the lottery industry. But that's a lottery that just feeds off the desperation of workers. because. Mm -hmm. I see so many of those people go in there and the look of despair on their face as they just hope maybe this is the ticket I scratch. It's going to get me into debt. It's going to yeah. make me able to finally pay my bills off. Yeah. And it's just see that every day that people don't need. And you, like you said, you can see it. It's crushing people. Mm -hmm. Like figuratively. Everyone I know. And Yep. And it's it's multiple yep. it's multiple prongs too. That's the thing. Because like mm -hmm. you have the cloud of debt hanging over you, which is just a constant source of like despair. So it's it's affecting your mental health. But on top of that, mm -hmm. it's it it's it costs money to be in debt as well. So mm -hmm. and then you add in that they're Robo phone call on you every day about that debt. Oh, dude, I hate the robo calls so much. Most of my robo calls don't even make sense. Yeah, half my uh, half the calls I get. Even Neil. You know. Hey, buddy. Half the calls I get are in Chinese. 
And I just say, can you please save us? And they, they hang up after that. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's absolutely depressing. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, again, uh, summarizing the political parties, you essentially have, um, let me know your thoughts, but you essentially have like standard liberal party that does the, the bare minimum just to not seem like they're too far to the right, but mm -hmm. it's never enough. We live under a liberal government right now and everybody's struggling. Uh, mm -hmm. I could bring up the statistics, but most Canadians are in debt. Um, well, our taxes and interest are so high because we have to keep paying for the billionaires overspending. Like, essentially, like, I know we don't have actual, like, bailouts a whole lot, but a lot of money is continually going to those corporations to help them stay afloat. I just don't think people realize it happens. Yeah. And <clears throat> the thing is, a lot of people delude themselves into thinking, like, oh, we don't have real capitalism because we do these bailouts. And my argument is, like, do you want to see what it would be like if we didn't? That'd be worse. That would be, that would be the quid. I almost wish it would happen just so you people could lose your pro capitalist talking points. Because what would happen was the system would collapse and we would have to figure something else out. That's why they do that. And I'll always argue back to that one day, just one day, one day of Rogers not working, our whole country fell to a standstill. See, uh, my thing is, if we bail out a company, that company should become citizen property. If you can't run yep. your company, a billion-dollar company, bye. You're broke on the street. You can just pull up your bootstraps and work hard. Don't worry. Nationalize It'll it. be a billionaire in no Nationalize time. it right there. Yeah. yeah, just nationalize it. All right. And, and not the government should run it. It should be ran by the people. Well... My my hope for Canada is eventually the government is run by the people. That is what's supposed. That's the crazy part. That's what's yeah. supposed to happen. Exactly. Yes. In, in that case, then yes. Just in the present. We're in this. No. We're in this quandary where nobody feels represented anymore. We're just stuck mm -hmm. with these parties. Same thing with every other Western country. Yeah. Guys, I just need to remind you. The government's supposed to be run by the people. They're supposed to be our representatives. Because back in the day, we had to do that. We had to elect representatives because they had to physically go to a place and figure stuff out with a bunch of other people that were represented to go to a place and figure stuff out. And um, then if they came back and didn't figure it out, you hit them with stuff. Like eggs, yeah. tar, and feathers. Exactly. They won't do it again. That's what should have happened. But instead of that, we're in this weird boat where we're just constantly, like the states, voting for lesser two evils, and these parties just do whatever the hell they want. If you don't believe me, ask, your, ask yourself, where was the vote? Where was the vote to involve ourselves with any support of a foreign country at all? whether it's Ukraine, Israel. Where is your vote to get militarily involved with then these geopolitical keep, conflicts? Why do we keep sending peacekeepers with guns to these foreign countries that aren't our business? Why are we funding I'll go terrorists? further. I'll go further. Where was your vote? Um... To lock the country down. I don't remember having a weigh-in on that. I just remember being told that's what I should do. And I should be a good little doggy. And I was a good little doggy. Because, you know, there. And they weaponized my empathy against me. Which, mm -hmm. that's a flaw of mine. But I digress. I don't think it's a bad flaw to have. Regardless. And we have the... I think you're correct there. And I was just going to say, we have the technology... To have direct, direct democracy. Yeah. You can log into a bank account. Sure, we can log into some voting systems. 
make some stuff secure. Yeah. They could, it could be so simple too. They could just, and they'll argue like, oh, it could be hacked. It could have Russian interference. China. They'll do that. I get it. But there's ways around that. Because if there weren't ways around that, you could use that as a defense for anything online mm-hmm. yep. at all. So, like, if you log into your CRA account, CRA is the IRS for uh, Canada. Yeah. Um, you could just argue like, oh, well, uh, Russian interference with my CRE account. You could argue that across the board, but it never it never holds any water. There's ways to do this. And like it could just be as simple as like if a government's proposing a policy, proposing something, just hold it up or have an open forum where everybody can weigh in on the decision. We can have a more dynamic government. As opposed to these yeah. parties that just sit there and are like, I think that's what the people want. Right. You could have a little pop up on your phone. Do politicians deserve a raise? Yes, no, and then guillotine. You just choose one of the options. And then no. you can have a pop up too that goes, should it be yes, no, or guillotine, or just guillotine, guillotine, extra guillotine with lubrication? Mm-hmm. So, so, like, you know, you, goes in. You got to Enough politicians lose their head, they're going to start working for us again. Yeah, I mean, listen, people can talk shit about France, but, you know, they knew what was up back in the day. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're still pretty like based France on it, their views. Yeah, like... Well, back, yeah, similar styles. Let's not forget, like, France tried to raise the pension age and it, the, the country turned into, like, doom eternal. It was just the whole country mobilized against them. So, like, let's take some pages out of their books. Because we're sitting here just, like, pleading for liberals to give us cookies. And it's like, ugh. See, if you had the app, every Canadian would have chose guillotine after that. Oh, yeah. Well, I would never have to worry about that idea coming up again. I would have chosen guillotine after after Trudeau was like, oh, we don't need electoral reform because we're in power. (laughs) Which was like a 15 year old. That was like a 12 year old like take. After that, I would have chosen guillotine because I'm like, that's why I voted for you, because I want Canada to be an actual democracy. I'd like to clarify, I am not advocating violence. I am vote I'm advocating for democratic guillotines. That is it. Yes, it should be a democratic decision we all make. I am also not advocating for violence. I'm advocating for the people's the people's choppy chop. Okay? People's <laughs> choppy chop chopper chop. face. Exactly. Yeah, basically what we got is we got, to summarize, we've got, like other Western countries, we've got the big parties, which are conservative and conservative with politeness, also known as conservative and liberal. The differences are we have a third party that has a bit more, uh, a bit more oomph, a bit more riz than, say, like the Green Party in the States. You know, they they get a they get a, a little bit of a chunk in the in the elections. However, the problem is the problem is um, they're in essentially a coalition with the liberals, and they are pretty much pretty much in lockstep with every initiative that matters. Mm-hmm. They they loudly disagree when the liberals are not. It's the same thing Bernie and AOC do. They align themselves with this faction, but then they complain about the faction. Mm. So I feel like largely, this is just my opinion, I feel like the NDP just exists to keep people out of the streets. They just exist to create the illusion that some party in Canada is fighting for you. They're fighting yeah. for your material We're condition. doing something. Except they're, they're never doing water. Mm-hmm. 
Guys, let's do a Zoom marathon and just someone in their seat moving their arms. We're in this together, guys. Pretty much. And the fact that they're they're aligned, they're in this weird coalition with the liberals to begin with. First off, it hurts them from anyone, anyone to the right of to the left of liberals, it hurts. It hurts them in that category. Because they're gonna be like, wait, why are you guys like in an allyship with liberals? That's Mm-hmm. And then to anybody to the right of them, it hurts them and the liberals. Because people are looking at liberals and going, why are you allied with these socialists or you know, whatever they've been propagandized to think? And then, you know, the other faction goes, or sorry, the other group of people goes, this faction is too, uh, too radical or whatever. So Largely, and then you've got the fringe parties, which uh, People's Party is pretty much fringe. Uh, dude's a little yeah. insane. He gives he gave some like it's your standard libertarian. Like if you're if you feel like free speech is important, if you feel like government overreach is a problem, both of which I do. Uh, but I don't I don't just feel like in a vacuum that's a problem. I feel like under a government that is essentially run by corporations, that's a problem. Because mm-hmm. if, if we actually had a democracy, that wouldn't be a problem because nobody would like nobody would be okay with it to begin with. And be like, yeah, I, I definitely think the government should clamp down on our, our our stuff. Nobody would be into that. But we don't have an actual democracy, which is why we're seeing this guy crap. So anyway. We're getting to the two hour point. Um, I hope this was educational for everybody and learning a little bit more about the dumpster fire that is Canadian politics. Um, and, and how we're not so different insofar as we have bots that run all our stuff as well. And uh, I'm pretty sure the bots are the people that are running the government, though. Maybe that's what they were. That talking would be about. a way. Maybe they're just. To, that would be. A, they're just trying to warn us. That would be a way more acceptable def like like explanation. 